Okay, please uh, continue to enjoy your meal. But I'd like to now introduce our keynote luncheon speaker, Mr. Donald Roussel. He's the Associate Assistant Deputy Minister, Safety and Security for Transport Canada. Uh, thanks for being here today, uh, Mr. Roussel, and we look forward to uh, hearing your remarks. Thank you. So uh, they ran out of Donald, so they called one from, uh, from the office next door. Uh, you have a lot of action. And many Americans in the, in the room, uh, show of hand. Oh, yes. Well, thank you. Uh, immigration is at the door. Uh, we'll be able to take your name. Uh, lots of actions on the, uh, on the world of UAV. Uh, I could have called this presentation uh, a disturbance near you. Uh, you are certainly uh, uh, at the forefront of uh, being extremely curious, but uh, also uh, being on a day-to-day -day basis on the, on the, uh, in the airspace, uh, a concern of what the heck is flying beside me and is this thing going to take me down. Uh, this is what we call disturbing technology. Uh, it's there to stay. It's very, very big. Uh, it's evolving at the speed of light. And uh, we cannot sort of say, well, forget about it. It will disappear. Uh, many, many years ago, 20 years ago, I done my master's degree in, uh, in the, uh, the use of simulators in the assessments of marine engineer. I'm a marine guy. And then uh, nobody believed in the use of simulator in the good old days. Uh, Transport Canada was filled with a good old British guy who uh, used to work on steamships and uh, could not believe that uh, simulator going to be used even if it was quite present in the aviation sectors. Uh, well, today we're using it uh, extensively. And uh, yes, it is a good tool for assessments. And we all also understand that you need to continue to master uh, a lot of practice. Uh, you cannot uh, beat the real thing. Seeing it is seeing it. Doing it is knowing it. Uh, so sim uh, UAVs is uh, for us at the department at the crossroad of uh, a noise and the disturbance, but also as a regulator, uh, the, uh, uh, the elements regarding on how we're going to get all this stuff to cohabit it. And uh, our main focus, uh, of course, uh, is uh, at this moment, and it's at the bottom of the presentation, is to deal with what I would call a bit of the noise. Uh, all those three million toys that are under the Christmas trees, uh, and that's going to come and disturb everyone, and then the smallest piece of operations and how we integrate that in the workplace. How we make sure that we're able, as a regulators, to educate the people, but also making sure that there's room for introductions of those uh, piece of equipment uh, in, a, in a marketplace where there's growing uh, safety concerns, security concerns, privacy concerns and the growth of the sectors. Uh, there's great, uh, there's uh, significantly great uh, applications. Uh, when I look at some, uh, I look at some data regarding, for example, work compensation boards and some of uh, the aviation sector's uh, premium that you have to pay when you're in different type of activities. And uh, I remember many years ago looking at uh, LE logging, which was uh, an activity that's quite, 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 uh, a very, very uh, dangerous operation, where they were paying, uh, that's many years ago, but they were paying $20 per $100 of salaries uh, before you even start the activities. Uh, the, the, the next one who was closer into how dangerous some of the activities uh, are is people who make vertical mines pits. That's mean the guy you know who drill and blow up and drill and blow up and try to save his life by the end of the day, not getting injured into this type of operations. Uh, so in the business of aviation, of course, uh, there is uh, fairly uh, risky uh, activities. Uh, uh, it's clear that uh, UAVs can take a lot of those type of activities on and be able to uh, maximize the use of, uh, of, uh, of, the, of the additional tool in the toolbox. So uh, global UAV industry, significant growth, uh, $6.4 billion annually, $11.5 billion uh, 
uh, moving forward. Uh, that's the expectations. We get toys in the range of uh, less than $1,500, something a little bit more exciting, up to 50, but 100,000, 150, a million bucks. You know, some of the airline pilot in the room will say, oh, that's nothing, a 350 costs 350 million, uh, lovely machine, this is nothing. Well, 350 million will buy a lot of those, and they'll be inside your airspace doing all sorts of different operations. So it's, uh, it's quite a game changer, it's present. If you are an air operator, uh, you cannot not look at this. Uh, if I take, uh, for example, uh, uh, the carriage of passengers apart, which is of course uh, something that we want to maintain a tenant minus night risk uh, type, uh, so a chance in 14 billion that you will not have an accident. There's many other operations in the, uh, in the aeronautic sectors uh, that uh, if you are managing businesses out there, you're giving services, you will be looking at those tools uh, to improve your toolbox and to improve the service you want to render to your client base and enlarge your client base uh, significantly. So the growth uh, is out there. Uh, this is what we've been facing from an S, just at the department, of course, uh, the F, uh, SFOC issues on UAVs, uh, an exponential growth. And uh, I don't need to tell you, we went from about 88 to, to 600, and it is continuously growing. In the smaller, uh, smaller business, you have operators like Lab, Inge, Robotic, Micro, uh, Dragonfly, and so forth. But you get uh, uh, other bigger operators who are uh, uh, pushing for uh, some type of equipment out there. I'll show you an example on the Coast Guard. So it's a growing business, and uh, it's, uh, it's used extensively already, not necessarily in an orderly fashion, and we as regulators need to put a little bit of order there. Uh, in the discussions we get with the sectors, uh, rarely, and probably a, a few, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll spark a few, a few laugh, they're chasing us to be regulated. Okay? This is uh, something that is pretty unique. Usually industry want the regulator to go away, but uh, that industry in general want to be regulated because uh, they want to make sure that the operations is safe and uh, operating in, uh, under uh, the same type of rules. So it is a, a critical piece. Incident, uh, of course, is growing, growing domestically, growing worldwide, uh, if you read the, the different news. So it's significant concerns when it comes to uh, uh, the interactions in the airspace, uh, the interactions around airports and in, uh, in the different uh, municipality. Last, uh, last spring or last summer, we had a, a case uh, during a fire in the Okanagan Valleys where uh, we were dealing with uh, an entire operation of firefighting for five hours. Uh, everybody were grounded because uh, somehow, somewhere, an individual was zooming around with his UAVs and uh, pretty well shutting down the airspace in that area until we find that joker. So uh, it was, uh, it, it, it was uh, of course, uh, imagine the damage, imagine the problem this is, this is causing uh, before you can resume, uh, uh, resume the firefighting operations. Uh, security concern, of course, is present. And uh, there is work that's underway at the uh, ICAO, Working Group on Threat and Risk, um, uh, AFSEC also panel. Uh, we have discussions with, uh, with uh, the, the ICAO on how fast they can move forwards and, uh, and improve the, the book of operations. Uh, I can tell you some of the discussions we had with them were not extremely convincing from a timeline perspective. Uh, when the overall standards would be complete by 2025, well, our common back will be, there's people who are gonna be washing your windows with UAVs by that time. Uh, so we gotta get out there and we gotta make sure we're accelerating uh, the developments of the standards of the use of the UAVs in the airspace and of course beyond line of sight. 
Uh, technologically speaking, this is all feasible, it's all workable. We know uh, you don't need to go in details of uh, what's happening in theater, in, uh, in foreign airspace, mainly on the military side. But more closer to us on, uh, on the domestic side, and I will use domestic side in the North American context, uh, NOAA is flying from uh, Martha Vanyard on a regular basis with UAVs uh, going to observe uh, the, uh, uh, the hurricane that are uh, plying the eastern seaboards of the uh, United States uh, and even in, into the Canadian airspace. So this is an example of a risky business where uh, who like to go and through an entire hurricane and have fun at the, at the, at the eye of it and coming out of it when the 200 mile an hour mi uh, uh, wind are striking you. So it's, uh, it's pretty challenging, and this is one example of things that are moving uh, and where uh, the use of UAV is certainly uh, uh, expanding. Uh, our approach so far in enhancing safety awareness, that's our three pillar, uh, revise uh, staff instructions and guidance material, social and traditional uh, media messaging, and then Safety First AC website. Uh, we have Heron on TV now, so he's a new, uh, he got his new YouTube channel going. So he's trying to make a buck out of it, but uh, he's not doing great. So if you, he's, he's out there. Uh, research and development, that's a key part. Uh, lots of work underway. Uh, we had the chance to go uh, last spring, the entire delegation to Alma, Quebec. Uh, where they have uh, the uh, 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 facilities there for, uh, for UAVs. They, they're working with uh, CFB Baggettville. They have developed with them an entire area over the Mont Valais on the north, north side of uh, the, Saguenay, the Saguenay River, an area pretty well the size of France uh, for testing UAV. Some other area in, uh, in over the the Laurentian Park between uh, Saguenay and, uh, and uh, Quebec, a fairly large area. And then, of course, uh, closer to the actual Alma site uh, over Lac Saint-Jean, where they can uh, use the different type of UAV for testing it. And we're talking here all beyond line of sight type of capabilities. Uh, there's other uh, uh, site in Canada, foremost in uh, Alberta, not visited yet from uh, I didn't visit it yet, but uh, anxious to go and see it. Uh, consultations with industry stakeholders, UAV challenges, and then, of course, information sharing between the different uh, government department uh, on both uh, the safety, the security, uh, the compliance, the enforcement, on how we, uh, we can regulate all this. Accelerated rulemaking, and it's almost an oxymoron, accelerating rulemaking. Uh, this is, we have to really uh, push this, but uh, we're pushed by the industry. We're also pushing internally, believe it or not. We have an airline that transport, which is called Aircraft Services. Uh, we have the challengers uh, VI, for the carriage of VIP, Prime Ministers, Minister, GG. Uh, we have uh, client, uh, uh, National Defense, uh, Coast Guard. Uh, we have our own uh, plane for uh, our pilots. So. Uh, and we have a project within, uh, within that group, a UAV project, and I'll give a little bit more detail at the end. So we try to, uh, to push even internally uh, our own folks at the uh, civil aviation side to say, well, okay, uh, here's what needs to be done, and how fast can you give me a permit on this? And then the answer sometimes, uh, come and see me again in six months. No, no, it's next week, it's next month. Think, think fast. We gotta sort those things. And uh, it's, it's been, uh, it's not quite a success here. We have a, still have a few obstacles. Uh, so the ongoing challenge, of course, jurisdictions, responsibility, province, municipalities, territories, uh, Canada, US even. Uh, so uh, lots of uh, folks in different cities will say, well, I want to impose a bylaw, I know UAV uh, bylaws. So we have to uh, try to adjust that privacy issue uh, with the privacy commissioners. Uh, enforcement on how we deal with that, uh, uh, doing it ourselves as court, but leveraging with, uh, with the enforcement organization uh, out there. Uh, the airspace safety, one of our biggest concerns at this moment. 
uh, the, uh, the detect and avoid and everything that go with that. So you can imagine on any of those small toys, you don't have any of this. Uh, so, but when you go beyond line of sight and equipment, this is technology that's got to really uh, uh, picked up. And then striking that balance out there uh, for the interest. But I think there's a great opportunity for Canada. We're a lot more nimble than our colleague from the south. Um, we uh, also from some of the European folks. So uh, with all good effort, I think we can, uh, we can really take advantage of our nimbleness and ac accelerating the, um, uh, the framework. Uh, there will be a lot of appetite for uh, what we will call an entire uh, holistic approach on how we can operate UAVs. So in the proposed uh, rulemaking and amendment, uh, we're, uh, we're working as fast as we can, uh, but uh, we're dealing with complex issue. We're dealing with uh, uh, limitations uh, because the, the thresholds uh, in the different categories are, uh, are quite uh, present all across from the little wee toy to somebody who have a legitimate business and want to operate something with a little bit more magnitude. Uh, the training, the registrations, so there's still a lot of aspect on how to deal with that. Uh, so the, uh, the pilot training, for example, is not quite regulated. So we try to frame that as, as much as we can. And also not losing the flexibilities. So how far we can go into establishing something that will make a little bit more uh, sense. Uh, on the global perspective, uh, you wake up one morning, you read the news, and first thing you know, the FAA has our 125 engineers to deal with uh, UAVs, and then there are, the phone is ringing in Canada, and our three robust staff will be uh, working with the US. And you can imagine <coughs> what we're facing, <coughs> and, then <coughs> and then we think we have uh, a few sites in Canada, well, you read a bit, and first thing you know, the Americans are throwing six test sites. Uh, they're financed by the Pentagon, and uh, it's going on and on and on. I'm, I'm, making, uh, I'm going a little bit big there. But uh, this is certainly challenges that uh, we're having uh, of uh, following with our American counterpart and be able to be at the table and discuss uh, on how to manage all this and not having uh, our colleague from the South uh, moving forwards with uh, sets of regulations that uh, might not be fully suitable for us, or having a, 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 a series of different uh, regime that are not quite harmonized Canada-US. And we have a, a big challenge on the harmonizations. Uh, in Europe, it's moving also for, uh, uh, fairly good. Uh, there's good uh, operators, there's good uh, Manufacturers who have good product will show you one that we did test. And our other partner, UK in general, Australia, New Zealand, are also accelerating the pace. They all face uh, different challenges, but uh, they're pretty well uniform. Uh, and then, of course, we try to, to get that into a rulemaking that will be under the international umbrellas of the ICAO. Uh, to make sure that we, uh, we are following and uh, we are uh, also ensuring that uh, we're able to participate as much as we can so that we do not end up with uh, a series of local rules that are a nightmare for operators and uh, do not serve us very well. Uh, the development of local rule is certainly one of the biggest challenge when you try to do harmonizations and for operators, it's some, uh, the level playing field that differ when you have an open economy where your business move Canada, US, Europe, uh, you cannot operate in that fashion. Uh, so uh, working with the UN organization as much as we can is certainly uh, uh, critical. And then of course, leadership Canada, US. On the enforcement, we're working with the, uh, the, the RCMP we're work, working also on a lot on research and development, try to have partners that, uh, and that was one of the questions we raised uh, when we were in Alma last year on this round table, who's working on the detect, the deter, uh, and uh, we, uh, we're quite happy that uh, there is a technology out there that, is, uh, that are under development where you will be able to, uh, uh, for example, uh, find out where all those uh, 
emitting emitters take place, screen out the good one, the one that or is not a, uh, an interference, and zoom in on the one that are the, the one that you want to have compliance and enforcement. So it's appeared that our, our research and development on that front is advancing. Uh, is it enough to make it commercialized? Uh, but the goal is uh, to find those individuals, to neutralize them also, uh, where there is a significant uh, disturbance. And then, of course, integrate that around uh, the different uh, uh, UAVs uh, uh, regime. Uh, no UAV zone, of course, is also one, but when we're dealing with people who don't want to understand, you can have all the UAV zone you want. They don't care. So uh, you have to have a fairly robust deterrent. Uh, the, um, the next one is, uh, <coughs> is our Transport Canada uh, UAV project. And what that is, is uh, our folks uh, under the National Aerial Surveillance Program, uh, we have the 2-8, uh, 1-7. Uh, they came to me uh, about a year and a half ago, and they said, well, we need to look at changing those machines. And I said, yeah, that's fine, but uh, we are in UAV uh, world. Uh, so we put together a project and uh, asked that we test UAV to add to the toolbox of uh, being able to uh, use these type of equipment beyond line of sight uh, in support of the, of the, uh, of the NAS program uh, in both uh, East Coast, West Coast, the North, but our first focus, of course, is the North. And uh, we receive a, a good envelope, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite an interesting project. The goal is to have by... Um, uh, by by uh, 2018, a sufficient amount of informations to be able to position ourselves for uh, either replacement of our uh, fixed-wing aircraft uh, or combination of fixed-wing aircraft and, uh, and uh, UAVs in the toolbox so that we're able to uh, work with our partners' departments and do more missions uh, in, 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 uh, in more area of uh, our great, uh, great country. So what is our visions for the, the north? So uh, you have the, the northern part between uh, 60 and 70 of parallel. Uh, what we're trying to do is uh, to see if we can have two UAV flying uh, from uh, Iqaluit on the east end and Inuvik on the other end so that uh, they can actually do the entire north and be able to go back to the base within uh, 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 the, the time of their, um, their, their, uh, the time of their operations. Uh, it's quite a challenge. <coughs> we, uh, we're just uh, at the RFI, the request for information. We did receive about 51 proposals. I can tell you there's a lot of people who want to sell you UAVs out there. We had to do a significant pre-selections uh, we don't have uh, uh, billions of dollars on this. We have a limited budget, but we think we can do uh, interesting things. And then after that, when uh, we will land on the type of equipment that we want to test, is actually go out there and uh, uh, physically test it, probably with some of our uh, test site, but also uh, uh, doing it after that, if we can, in the north. Uh, so that's give us... You have uh, on this, for example, the uh, 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 24 operations for Michalowit in, uh, in red, which would be UAV operations. In green, it's the uh, operations of, uh, the, uh, uh, of, of our actual airplane. And of course, we have Greenland on the other side. Uh, we're not quite uh, in discussions with Denmark yet, but uh, you can imagine that uh, if we have asset able to do so much uh, work, we can have international corporations. Uh, the two machine, <coughs> if we operate in parallel from Inuvik to Iqaluit, can cover uh, the entire Arctic uh, and uh, having their own base in Iqaluit and Inuvik uh, where the partners will be uh, uh, putting together the, uh, 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 the refueling, the new pods for different missions and be able to fly the machine again. 
Uh, and then we're working also with uh, our colleague at Coast Guard uh, on some demonstrations. So as you know, Coast Guard vessels do have uh, helicopters. Uh, they are operated uh, uh, with our pilots, so it is extremely useful. But a lot of the activities uh, using the, the helicopter also is used for construction, support. You still need the big machine. But some other operations is uh, ice reconnaissance, is uh, leading the ship through the ice pack, through the leads. Uh, so what they done uh, uh, last month, no, it's in April, they done that this month, uh, they, uh, they had the chance to have a, a, a test beyond line of sight. Uh, the machine that they use uh, had a capacity of uh, 200 mile. Uh, they use it only uh, around 20 uh, nautical mile. And our friends uh, at Civil Aviation, our colleagues, uh, uh, it was quite a challenge to obtain a permit to do this, I was told, and uh, they had to actually go in international water to test it, which don't make me very happy, uh, because uh, I would have liked to, to say, okay, it's, we're flying this thing, uh, give us a permit next week, and we were told it will take many months to be able to do this in Canada. So, uh, we're working on that. I don't have the full detail of that story, but uh, where we need that, when, when we're saying we're challenging ourselves internally, that's what I mean. We're doing it, we're testing it, we're pushing ourselves to the limits so that we can better serve the industry. So I have a little video, it's about two minutes, on, the, uh, on this uh, Coast, Guard, uh, Coast Guard experience, which is a, a, it was a very successful experience. accomplished everything we wanted for the operational side, plus we did some extra projects as the day went along. Um, from ice reconnaissance is a big one, and that worked well. Uh, the IR camera, uh, that was very impressive uh, when we saw the uh, seals on the ice, uh, which would be great for a search and rescue aspect. And just the robustness of the aircraft and the range was amazing. We had the monitor on the bridge so we could see what the payload was showing and that was useful when we could direct the uh, pilot to investigate when we were in heavier icing. You could distinguish between the light ice and the heavier ice. You could plot the ice edge, which is basically what we needed for because when we were transiting from A to B through ice, we were restricted by our height of eye on the bridge, which on this ship is about 50 feet. Your horizon at 50 feet is a lot better when you're at 400 feet. <laughs> so a lot of times you're blindly going up to your limit of visibility a bird's eye view, uh, yeah, is a great benefit. Of course, it's a lot of publicity for this company, and they even paint the machine uh, the color of the Coast Guard, which they never quite purchased yet. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, we could not, uh, of course, resist to do this. Uh, that's, uh, it was extremely important that uh, we give this trial a shot. Uh, first for, of course, the beyond line of sight uh, testing, 
but also to, uh, to add uh, to the, uh, the toolbox. Uh, Coast Guard got brand new helicopters. They want to maximize the use of those helicopters, but the demand for many, many of their other activities with the different uh, player on their platform is uh, extremely demanding. And uh, as much as they can use the suite of different other equipment, uh, it will maximize the use of uh, the asset out there. Uh, you were in, uh, of course, first year eyes you know, outside uh, Newfoundland uh, to about around Fogo Island. Uh, but imagine uh, if you have uh, multi-year eyes or you are in the Arctic uh, where you want to have an eye bird view and you want to be able to have that eye bird view days and night. Uh, so uh, the use of these type of equipment really improve the safety, of course, of the vessels. And you can have a vessel that will be moving in multitask, the, the regular helicopter doing some work ashore uh, with uh, lighthouse or navigation equipment, the UAV moving into another directions, and uh, our own drone, we dream, uh, zooming some other informations uh, all in uh, simultaneously to maximize uh, the impact that we got. So uh, our next steps, of course, uh, is uh, uh, on, on many of the elements that we're moving forwards is uh, uh, in the summer, we'll seek to renew the safety awareness campaign <coughs> and work with the stakeholders. Uh, we'll continue to work, of course, on our regulatory uh, regime. Uh, our the, uh, deputy ministers is continuing to engage the province, the territories, and support on UAV through uh, the Council of Deputy. Uh, we, uh, we're participating uh, on regular interdepartmental meeting on UAVs to identify gap and opportunities. Uh, we hope from uh, the RFI uh, uh, to move to RFP in the fall uh, on our own UAV projects and uh, to, uh, to deal with uh, the procurement uh, for uh, 2018. And we continue to further demonstrate, uh, of course, the suitable test range uh, in summer of 2016. And uh, we also want to, uh, to move forward, of course, with our re regulations. Uh, for, uh, <coughs> uh, for visual light of sight, we're for the less than 25 uh, kilogram, but uh, beyond line of sight is uh, the thing that all the operators are telling us, you gotta focus, and it's a little bit more complicated piece, uh, but we're totally engaged at, uh, at doing it. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roussel. Um, very interesting topic. I can assure you that uh, not just pilots, but other industry stakeholders are very interested in, in UAVs. There was a number of uh, stakeholders that uh, jointly sent a letter to the minister recently, and uh, we certainly uh, look forward to working with you and the department in, in uh, furthering uh, the, the regulations as we move forward. Uh, Mr. Roussel has uh, agreed to uh, take some questions on his presentation or uh, perhaps any other areas of his responsibility in the Minister's office. So we'll open it up now. <laughs> Mr. Roussel, thank you. My name is Bruce McPherson. I'm from the Clarion Drone Academy. Uh, one of my concerns, I've been in the aviation industry now for some time. We manufacture avionics equipment, understand the concerns of pilots and aviation as a whole. One of my biggest concerns right now in this particular in industry, or even over the last couple of years, is you mentioned in your presentation that Canada is somewhat ahead of the Americans, and truly I do believe that as well. But we are not ahead of the Europeans, or of the people in New Zealand, or Australia, and Japan. They are a minimum of two years ahead of us when it comes to regulations. And some of those regulations actually break down into uh, what we have or what you have proposed here by the end of 2016. But what are my concerns as a school in teaching our pilots to be actual pilots when they're flying their aircraft? So we do ground school, flight school, just as the Europeans do right now in their schools. They have licensed schools and permits to actually train pilots before they're released with a permit to be able to go out and fly. Right now, the environment in, in Canada is such that anybody can hang a shingle out, profess to be a professional pilot or school, and teach, and the general public is no wiser. And I'm just wondering how you might respond to that. Thank you. Okay. 
And that's a question as difficult as uh, probably Christine will have asked me in the back, which is uh, one of our union leader. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> it's a good one. I think uh, uh, we, you, I mentioned it, we have to accelerate. Uh, yes, uh, we like to be a little cocky when we say, well, we're ahead of X, Y, Z. Honestly, I think we're, in, in some aspect, you're quite right. We are on some aspect, we're not on other. We have to play catch up. Uh, the, uh, the, reg the regulatory regime that we got is, uh, is certainly not uh, uh, nimble. Uh, we have a, a large list of regulation that we want to push, uh, but uh, to specific to your details, uh, harmonization is the key part. And if there is, a, in your view, as a stakeholders, uh, some element that need to be introduced inside the regulations that are on the, in developments or in, who have been published in, the in, uh, in Brazil, like you mentioned, or Japan, uh, or in Europe, uh, our folks are more than willing to look at this and try to integrate it. So part of your, uh, in the consultation, uh, this is uh, to you as a stakeholders to really educate us uh, as a regulators because, you know, people sometimes think that we know a lot of things, but we're, we rely a lot on the industry in the interactions of what's happening out there. And then uh, we're able to, uh, when it's time to push for the, uh, the, reg the regulations, to, uh, uh, to convince uh, ministers to say, well, you know what, this is, this is not different than what they have in other jurisdictions. So I encourage you to, to continue to push and, uh, and voice your, uh, uh, your concerns uh, on the fact that, yes, we're not necessarily moving fast enough on many, on many fronts. And uh, as a, a past examiner of marine engineer, of course, but I was director also of personnel for navigators, and, uh, uh, and assessments of individuals and making sure the people who are authorized to operate thing have appropriate qualifications is paramount. And uh, you don't want to, to uh, ease off uh, too much on the freedom, uh, but on the other hand, uh, how you cross all those, uh, those on one end to have a very rigorous regime under ICAO, structure IMO, and on the other end, like you mentioned, uh, Anyone who can hang a shingles can be a, an operator is a little scary. Okay. So I'll leave it to that. I don't have a, a 300% answer to your questions, but I think uh, you, you are the professional who can help us at uh, advancing those regulations. Hey, I take another question, even from Christine, you know. Mr. Roussel, uh, Jeff Cochran with Nav Canada. Uh, as one of the uh, agencies of, that are going to be the first eyes often on these events and have them reported through pilots and through to the towers and, and other centers, uh, the challenge you put up with enforcement, uh, one of the challenges we face is obviously when we get notified and then trying to notify a law enforcement agencies, um, where do you see the, the quickest way or the easiest way to get the uptake on the law enforcement aspect of uh, actually looking after the things that you're, you're putting out for regulation and enforcement. Yeah, well, I think uh, I look at the world in, in aviation, you know, I, I like to look at it from the, of course, the, uh, the aircraft, uh, the, uh, the airport, the airspace, and the airline. Uh, in this world, we're dealing with uh, the airspace and the airport. Uh, the, uh, there, what we have as a challenge is that uh, the enforcement organization, police uh, in, in general, or even uh, the people in charge of security at the airport, safety and security, uh, we need to connect those organizations a lot better. You saw it in my presentations where we have at the uh, deputy uh, roundtable, uh, deputy minister roundtable of transport, uh, the, the better integration of province, municipality, so that you, uh, NAF Canada, uh, can connect more rapidly to uh, the appropriate enforcement organization who will be able to go out there and chase the fellows. Well, first of all, find him and chase it. And then find, find him and find him or her who are using those things. So uh, we're not quite there. There's still a tremendous amount of work. Uh, and it's not a natural fit. Uh, uh, when the, uh, it's a rare sum that uh, in the air sectors, from a, uh, an airspace perspective, you're calling the police. I mean, you know, 
you have an airplane in the air and you're not a regular customer. You're not like uh, the, uh, the, the bus operators or people operating in the, in, uh, on the ground itself. So it's a, it, it's a change of dynamic. We have to uh, connect all those different groups that are not connected together. It will take a while. But uh, I can tell you, uh, the working group we have on enforcement, uh, we had one uh, workshop or seminar last uh, couple days uh, last fall, and uh, I can tell you the RCMP is, is on this. They're, they were ready to buy gazillions of gadgets to go and kill those UAVs wherever they were. <laughs> I mean, uh, they were full of imagination uh, and chasing a big budget. Uh, they were all very interesting dialogue, but I would say that you know the, uh, uh, the, 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 the drone chaser who chased another drone and they can throw a net on it and knock it off, it was pretty uh, basic technology. Uh, I think we got to step up our game, uh, be a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more uh, technology uh, called savvy uh, to be efficient in this domain. Uh, and, and, uh, and they understand that. So, Still a lot of work. There's an entire uh, cottage industry that is building on, on UAV and the, and the spin-off. Other question? Great, Mr. Russo. Nick Seymour from the Airline Pots Association. I'll be the first one to stray away from your presentation and ask a, a question on a different subject. I've collected my thoughts in writing so I don't lose it here. In, a, in the, the recent federal budget, the government outlined numerous um, infrastructure expenditures. They didn't mention any air transportation or aviation infrastructure improvements, yet the CTA report recently mentions a big need for that, especially in the north. So I'm just wondering, how, is, how do you see transport <coughs> addressing that if it hasn't been addressed in the budget? Yeah, that's a very, very good question. Uh, it's, there, there is, a, there is a, inside the, uh, the budget the portions regarding to uh, transportation infrastructure and uh, uh, the, the full, uh, the full uh, criteria regarding the infrastructures uh, budgets for transportation, uh, including transportation corridors, is not quite all finalized. Uh, so our, our past uh, deputy minister is, not, is, not there, is now there, Jean-François Tremblay. Uh, with Minister Soe. So they're in the, they got off, they got out the gate a, a bit of money, but there's a lot more coming uh, from a, a more specific perspective with a lot, a lot more details to come on where the money need to be used. Uh, your point on the CTA review is, is critical because uh, the minister will be doing a series of front table uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, the feedback from, uh, from the Emerson report. Uh, uh, and it's, uh, it, it's where more clarity will be coming on where the, uh, the need are present. They don't want to, uh, to start again another consultation, but more validate some elements of it. It will be under invitations, but uh, there we're, do, we're working on this in, in the department uh, so that both the infrastructure ministers and the specific money for infrastructure funding in the transportation domain and the CTA report merge to give a clearer directions of where the fund gonna go and be able to support the transportation sector. But there is a significant uh, willingness to enhance the transportation infrastructures and by the same way the transportation system in Canada. Okay? All right. Oh, you got another one? I need to go after that. Uh, but, uh, time is money. <laughs> time, well, that, no, that's fine. I have a day job. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> uh, Robert Fulton, Airline Pilots Association. Uh, safety as Transport Canada is a primary responsibility. Uh, we are aware of the significant budget challenges that uh, you guys are faced with. Um, what measures are being taken to return the uh, department to the point where it's adequately uh, able to interface with the industry to advance safety? Uh, that's that's almost, a new, that's almost another Christian question, but that's a good one. Okay, uh, what we done uh, uh, last year and what's happened in the department and why it's uh, where we finished in the Global Mail, uh, where it's mentioned that the oh, Treasury Board is watching at the department, uh, it, uh, and they have a, uh, we have a, uh, an attaché, we will call it like that, uh, of Treasury Board with us. 
uh, is that uh, uh, we had surplus in the past. Uh, we, when we finished the year, we had surplus. Uh, and surplus sometimes is a, for all sorts of reasons, but when we were during, certainly the, during the sword wrap, when they ask you to reduce the budget, uh, when people actually leave, you don't replace them. At the end of the year, we finish with a surplus. <coughs> Our ask was, were very clear. We were in asking mode. We said, no, we cannot continue like that. We need the people. Okay? We need to have the, uh, the people in a post-megantic world. And then uh, we were instruct uh, very clearly and, uh, uh, to say, well, okay, I read the, fo the folks. And we hired the uh, staff in, uh, in, in pretty well, uh, well, in all the modes, uh, marine, aviation, TDGs, rail. Uh, we ramp up uh, our uh, oversight personnel uh, so that we're able to uh, first meet Meet, meet the work that we need to do, but I think we, well, I don't think, we did overshoot. So uh, what's happened, we overshoot over our reference level, uh, and then we end up in situations where we, uh, we had uh, too many uh, people for the money we can afford. So the instructions, of course, from Treasury Board is to readjust within our, our uh, level, reference level. We're working on this as we speak, and it's, it's done by attrition. And then after that, of course, uh, through, like many other departments in, uh, in town, uh, I think three or four, we're under comprehensive review. So comprehensive review is not, it's not a cut, it's a uh, readjustment of your finance, uh, trying to find 5% uh, of your lower activities that you may decide that you don't want to do anymore and reinvest that money in higher activities. Uh, that's an exercise of, uh, Good exercise, but it's more like rubbing Peter to pay Paul for a while and readjust. We are, at least uh, I'll talk for the safety and security portfolio, we're still in demand mode. And uh, we're still in grown mode in many, many aspects of the business we're in. We try to readjust the way we're doing the business. Uh, we uh, try to push and we have some, uh, what we call some gates uh, of, for accessing some of the money. Uh, but we've been requested to present a user-free framework. So if you read the, uh, 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 the CTA report, uh, there's, there's a need in there, and it's identified that we need to have user fee. Uh, so uh, some of our fees never been touched in 20 years. Uh, they're part of 15 statute and uh, probably uh, have like 500 different items. So uh, we're tasked to look at this, try to readjust, but... Uh, uh, and then bring some money to continue to finance our activity. So we hope uh, for uh, 2000, uh, even in the second half of this year, we're gonna have a little bit of a breathing room. Uh, and then next year when we will have uh, table our frameworks uh, and uh, finish the comp review that we're in a lot more stable stage and we don't have to go to large fluctuations in our uh, budgets to be able to make ends meet. So. Uh, that, that's all, all what I would say at this stage, but we're, we're on it. We're on the right track, but it's, it's painful, and uh, we wish we could uh, uh, participate more, uh, have more people working on key pieces like regulations, uh, but uh, we're in government, and we need to also obey by the Financial Administration Act, you know, not blowing our budgets and readjusting our activity as needed. Okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Been great.